welcome everyone to section number eight. This is Stokes Theorem. And in this video here, right, we're going to upgrade from Green's Theorem to Stokes Theorem. I'm going to try to explain kind of how we do this upgrade really from a, a two-dimensional proof, right? Green's Theorem had something to do with this XY plane, and now we're going to be doing it in three dimensions. That's the Stokes Theorem version. So, okay, let's go ahead and review Green's Theorem, right, which we said in 16.5 can be expressed in these terms, right? So there were a bunch of conditions, right? A lot of conditions up here, but the big things here is C is a closed curve. It bounds a region D. We're in the XY plane. And we said if we sum up the circulation around the curve, right, we evaluate out uh, this line integral. This is the same thing if we go ahead and we calculate out the curve the, the curl at every single point in the region D, and we add that all up, right? So that there's a lot of cancellation here. All right, so if we start thinking about the upgrade, right, we can easily upgrade our, our curve, right, C, to be a, you know, a space curve. And then if it's a space curve, right, maybe it bounds some surface S in space, right? Not necessarily, you know, something in the XY plane, but now anywhere in space. So we'll have a nice surface S. Um, we can still have R parametrize the curve, right? But now it's going to have a Z component. Uh, our vector field F, right, can have three dimensions. So instead of just, you know, an X component and a Y component, it'll also have a Z component. And then the final thing is, how do we upgrade K? Should it still be K, or what was special about K? Why did this show up here? We really do have to think about that in order to get the correct upgrade for Stokes' theorem. Okay, and so I claim that if, let's go down here actually really quick. I'm gonna draw a, a fast picture here. So if I go ahead and I have my favorite region maybe in the XY plane, so here's my X's, here's my Y's, here's Z's. My favorite region in the XY plane, something like this. And we remember from Green's theorem, right, we have this region D inside maybe. And if we are parametrizing this so that we go in this nice counterclockwise direction, then if I go ahead and draw K on here, right, K looks like this. It's kind of, it's an upward pointing, uh, and this is a unit, and better yet, it's normal to the surface. So it's an upward pointing unit normal vector here. Right? And it follows this right-hand rule, right? If I was to get out my right hand, although it's kind of hard to do on the computer screen, right? And I was to kind of curl my fingers in the direction of this curve here, my thumb would be pointing in the direction of this purple vector here, K. So K was actually special because it was a vector. It was a unit normal vector that followed this right-hand rule. So again, that's what was special about K in Green's theorem. Now we need to go ahead and then upgrade, right, for Stokes theorem. Again, there are a lot of conditions up here, right? So S should be an oriented piecewise smooth curve that is bounded by a simple closed piecewise smooth boundary curve C with positive orientation. F should be a vector field whose components have continuous partial derivatives, right? Lots of conditions up here basically saying that we're playing with nice things. And, right, we're in space now. It contains S, and if all that's true, right, then the claim is the line integral of f dot dr over our curve c is going to be equal to the surface integral. Right now we're integrating over a surface. It may not be in the xy plane anymore. Still, we're going to calculate out the curl of our vector field f, and then we're going to dot it with a unit normal vector, right? So I'm just going to say that this is n a unit normal vector, and it should follow this nice right-hand rule. And then instead of dA, right, we're on the surface, so we're going to be doing dS here. All right, and that is the statement of Stokes' theorem. Again, it is an upgrade from Green's theorem. If you kind of think logically about these things, right, we can upgrade uh, from Green's to Stokes' theorem. Again, the important thing here is that n is an upward pointing, unit normal vector and c is positively oriented when viewed from above if you want to generalize this we can do that using the right hand rule that is as our fingers go around the curve our thumb 
will point in the direction of the unit normal vector. Okay, so let's go ahead and sketch a picture of what maybe Stokes' theorem is telling us. So I'm going to go ahead, again, have my space, x, y, z. And maybe now I have some curve here that's hovering in space, something like this. So this is not in the x, y plane. I know it's kind of, it's hard to tell that just from my nice 2D picture here. So it's hovering in space, and maybe we... Uh, parameterize this, right? Our R is going to parameterize this, and maybe we do go around in this counterclockwise direction. And then we have some surface. So this is S, and we have some surface attached to this. So something like here. So some surface that's attached to this. Maybe I'll go ahead and color this in a little bit. So a surface that's attached, right? Because again, this curve C needs to bound the surface. like so. All right, so here is our surface S. And if we were to go ahead and parameterize, right, this curve, right, we would get our thumb pointing in this upward direction. And so if I was to maybe specify at a given point here, something like this, I would have to have the unit normal vector that's going in the outward direction or the upward direction here. So this would be our n value. In fact, maybe I should do this in a different color here. I'll do something like this. So this is our n value right here. And of course, as you change points on the surface, right, that n's going to change. So maybe over here, the n's kind of pointing in this direction, right? It's not going to be always kind of a static thing. It's going to change depending on what your x, y, and z values are. So now here's our n, maybe back on this side. Right, it's going to look like this. Right, so we're going to have a bunch of unit normal vectors, but the big thing here is that they should all be pointing kind of upward or outward, right? So we know all these orientation words. They should follow this right-hand rule. All right, and so the last thing I want to tell you guys about before we do an example here is that unlike some theorems, right, Stokes' theorem is really a two-way street. So sometimes you kind of start with a line integral and you trade it in for the surface integral. Sometimes you start with a surface integral and you trade it in for the line integral. And this is kind of different than some theorems out there, right, like Green's theorem. When we calculated out Green's theorem, we always started with a line integral and we traded it in for a double integral. We always went in this one direction. But Stokes' theorem is really a two-way street. So sometimes you will trade in for the surface integral. Sometimes you will trade in for the line integral. And there are reasons to do both of these things. So we need to be good about calculating out each of these. And kind of in class, we'll talk about this more, kind of why you would want to make some of these trades. But for right now, I want to give us some practice calculating out both of these things. So I have a nice vector field here pretty simple one, all things considered, a nice surface, and I would like to calculate out both of these things and verify that we actually get the same answer. All right, so starting with our surface integral, the first thing we want to do is calculate out the curl. So let's get started. We're going to have our i's, j's, k's. We're going to have the partial with respect to x, the partial with respect to y, the partial with respect to z. And then we're going to go ahead and put in our components of our vector field here. So that's going to be x y, z. Okay, so we're going to have stuff with i's minus stuff with j's plus stuff with k's. Cross out the i components, right? We're going to have the partial of z with respect to y minus the partial, oh, sorry, the partial, of, <laughs> yes, z with respect to y, the partial of y with respect to z. Ooh, talking's hard. Next up, cross out our z's. We're going to have the partial of z with respect to x. We're going to have the partial of x with respect to z. Finally, switch, uh, cross out our k's. And we're going to have the partial of, let's see, x with respect to y. And minus the partial of uh, the partial of y with respect to x and the partial of x with respect to y. And so we get a very nice and boring curl vector here, right? 0, 0, 0. And so if you wanted to evaluate out the surface integral, Right? And we would have 0, 0, 0. And the next thing you would do is figure out what is that good n value in this case. But really, when you dot product it with anything, uh, sorry, when you dot product 0, 0, 0 with anything, you're just going to get 0. 
And so you're going to have the surface integral of 0 ds. And so when you add 0 to itself a bunch of times, really no matter how many times, right, you're always going to get 0 in this case. All right, so this is pretty remarkable, right? You probably wouldn't guess, like out of the two here, right, if you had to guess between a line integral and a surface integral, which one's going to be easier, you'd probably guess the line integral, right? These came up uh, first, and they're generally cons they generally are easier. Uh, but in this case, we are able to evaluate out the surface integral very quickly. Now, before I move on and we'll do the calculation for the line integral, I do want to get a little bit of practice actually figuring out what would this normal vector be. So that's going to be kind of a challenging thing for a lot of these problems. So I think it's worthwhile to go ahead and get a little practice now. So, so far we've only dealt with our vector field. Now, of course, the normal vector is the normal vector to the surface. So we need to go ahead and look here. And it says that it's oriented in the I direction, right? So this is picking a side of the surface. So let's go ahead and draw here. We have our X's, we have our Y's, we have our Z's. And this is going to be the surface. Well, it's X equals zero. So this is going to be the same thing as, right, the Y, Z plane. So x equals 0 is the yz plane. So it's a piece of this plane right here. Right? That's the yz plane. And it looks in the sheet of paper, right? Again, here's y, here's z. So it's kind of going in and out like that. But it's only the piece where y squared plus z squared is less than or equal to 1. So y squared plus z squared is less than or equal to 1. So that's going to be right at the inside of a circle of radius 1, right? Because y squared plus z squared equals 1. Well, that would be the circle of radius 1. So let's go ahead and maybe draw that. So something like this in that yz plane there. But now it's the inside of this, right? The radius can be less than or equal to 1. So this is the piece of that surface, x equals 0, in the, well, so, and that is the yz plane. But again, it's only a piece of it. So there is our surface in this case. And it's oriented in the y direction. So <laughs> oriented in the i direction, right? So that means i direction is the positive x direction. So that means that our normal vector is heading in this direction. So let's, by looking at the surface, let's go ahead and figure out, is this parametrized clockwise or counterclockwise, right? If I was to roll my fingers around the surface, right, in order to get my thumb to point in this end direction, I claim that we'd have to be going around the surface like this. We'd have to be going around this curve, really, like so, in order to get, again, in order to get our thumb pointing in the right direction. So in this case, we're going to be kind of going around the curve in this counterclockwise direction in order to get our thumb pointing in that I direction, right? That's going to be our unit normal vector. Okay, so with this idea, let's go ahead and calculate out our line integral then. So the line integral, notice we have using this boundary notation. This is the boundary of S, right? So again, boundary. And that's going to be where y squared plus z squared is equal to 1, right? Because again, we've now looked at our surface. And on the boundary of that surface, that's when y squared plus z squared equals 1. And that's part of the xy plane. That's where x is equal to 0. So where x is equal to 0. OK, so this is going to be the line integral of f, which was x, y, z, dot dr. So this is where I need to go ahead and parametrize that curve. So again, here's the curve information. So let's go ahead and try to parametrize it. So I'm going to say maybe a parametrization, r of t, would be something like, well, x is equal to 0. And then if I want y squared plus z squared to equal 1, I'm going to be thinking about sines and cosines. So maybe I'll go ahead and try cosine of t and sine of t. And now, first of all, does this satisfy x equals 0? Well, absolutely. If we go ahead and we put cosine squared and we add that to sine squared, does that equal 1? Absolutely. And then t would range from 0 to 2 pi. Now, the only thing that's left here is 
does this go in the correct direction? Did I parameterize it in the correct direction, right? So let's go ahead and check that. So for instance, if I plugged in t equals zero, and then I plugged in t equals pi over two, let's see which direction we're headed in. So at t equals zero, this would output the vector, right? Zero, one, zero. If I was to input pi over two, this is an ugly pi, there we go. If I was to plug in pi over two, I would get out zero, and let's see, zero, and one. So let's go ahead and plot these two vectors, or we're gonna plot them really as points here on our surface. Uh, so zero, one, zero, so x is zero, y is one, z is zero, that's gonna be right there. So that's our first one, when t equals zero. And when t equals pi over two, it was zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one. So that's gonna be up here at pi over two. So it seems like we're heading in this correct direction, right? We started off at zero and then we headed to pi over two. So yes, we are going around in the correct direction. So you do have to be careful with your parameterizations here that they're headed in the right direction. Okay, so now let's go ahead and do the dot product again with dr. So this is r right here, so I need to do dr, right? So I'm gonna do the derivative of this thing. So that's gonna be zero, and then we're gonna have, let's see, negative sine of t, and let's see, cosine of t, and then, good, dt. Great, so this is gonna be the integral. It's gonna be from zero to two pi. And then we're gonna plug in right everywhere we see an x because this is gonna be a t integral. I don't like that we have x's, y's, and z's. So I'm gonna plug them in with our parameterization here. So everywhere I see an x, I'm gonna plug in a zero. Everywhere I see a y, I'm gonna go ahead and put a cosine. And everywhere I see a z, I'm gonna go ahead and put a sine, right? Because that's the third component here. And then I'm gonna dot that with my dr. And so I'm gonna get the integral from zero to two pi, and when I do the dot product, let's see, I get negative sine of t cosine of t plus sine of t cosine of t dt. So you can see we have a negative and a positive, those perfectly cancel out, so I'm integrating zero from zero to two pi, and that is gonna give us out the answer of zero. All right, and so this has been a nice verification of Stokes' theorem, right? No matter what we did, we got zero, either if we evaluated out that surface integral or if we evaluated out the line integral. But again, the claim is we'll see in class, there'll be some times where the surface integral is easier to do. There'll be some times where the line integral is easier to do. So again, Stokes' theorem is really a two-way street. All right, I'll see you guys later.